Um, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning if you are in, in Canada, in North America. Bonsoir, buonasera. And um, welcome to this event organized by the University of Calabria in collaboration with the Chanti Magazine and with the technical support of Ilan, the English Language Arts Network. Um, the event is part of a series of webinars in which the upcoming book, Here and Now, an anthology of queer Italian-Canadian writing, edited by Alicia Canton, is presented to the public. Uh, we're going to listen to five of its others, read and discuss their writing. But before that, I would like to introduce Professor Raffaele Perelli, the head of the Department of Humanities of the University of Calabria, one of the institutions supporting the publication of the anthology. Um, Professor Perelli, thank you for being here despite your many commitments. And I know that you're going to speak Italian, so I'll briefly translate what you say after your talk. So the floor or, well, the screen is yours. Thank you. Grazie. Eh, buonasera a tutti. Intendo innanzitutto ringraziare il professor Mirko Casagranda, che con questa, come con altre iniziative, collabora principalmente all'attività di internazionalizzazione eh, del Dipartimento di Studi Umanistici. Eh, per di più, eh, la presentazione di, di questa dell'antologia odierna che oggi andiamo a presentare eh, rientra nelle attività di terza missione del Dipartimento di Studi Umanistici, che forse è cosa che detta così eh, suona eh, estranea eh, alla cultura di alcuni partecipanti, ma eh, rientra diciamo, in quell'ambito che eh, proprio con un anglicismo in Italia si suole chiamare public engagement, cioè fa parte di quel ruolo eh, che l'università svolge per far crescere le competenze eh, costituzionali, per dir così, della cultura costituzionale degli studenti. Potrebbe essere una prima pausa per tradurre, se, o vuoi tradurre tutto alla fine? Eh, non ti sento. Sorry about that. So, uh, Professor Perelli thanked me for um, organizing this, which is part of our um, series of activities that we do with international partners. And this is also part of what is called in, 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 in the academic Italian system, terza missione, third mission, which is opening up to uh, the citizenship, what we also call uh, public engagement. So uh, that's part of, 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 of this. Uh, yeah. Il Dipartimento di Studi Umanistici dell'Università della Calabria è particolarmente attivo eh, su eh, tutte le tematiche di inclusione. Non solo è attento alle tematiche di inclusione sociale che, appartengono, eh, che pertengono alla differenza di censo e di opportunità eh, tra gli studenti, ma anche alle tematiche di inclusione di genere. Eh, tutte queste tematiche sono eh, raccolte dentro l'impegno del Dipartimento di Studi Umanistici e del Comitato Universitario di Garanzia e eh, nel fatto che è il primo dipartimento che si è dotato di un delegato per le carriere alias, è un dipartimento che ha eh, dedicato attenzione alle carriere alias prima ancora, eh, credo che sia tra i primi dipartimenti d'Italia, aver dedicato attenzione alle carriere alias. Um, Non si sente Mirko, sento. Sorry. No? Yeah. So, uh, um, so this is part of, uh, um, we are uh, supporting this event as a department and as a university, um, also because of uh, uh, the attention that we pay to inclusivity and in particular, um, uh, social and uh, class inclusivities for, for the students, of course, but uh, also as far as gender is concerned. And we are uh, among the, the first departments of the university to um, introduce what is called alias career, uh, an academic career for transgender students who um, ask for uh, a new name to be used, to be identified with, and that name is used for every university and academic activity within, of course, our uh, campus. So for the exams, for lessons, and so on and so forth. Grazie. Vedo che hai spiegato appunto cos'è la carriera alias, eh, che è una cosa che è poco nota anche a molti eh, colleghi dell'università. Eh, peraltro il Dipartimento da molto tempo ha avviato un percorso di ricerca anche, quindi non soltanto di terza missione, fondato sul dialogo con le comunità 
eh, di origine eh, italiana e con le comunità italofone come quella del Canada eh, e nel novero di queste iniziative come eh, il professor Casagranda sa bene va compresa anche un percorso formativo quello di Italian Studies eh, curato dalla professoressa Margherita Ganeri un percorso formativo dentro la laurea magistrale in filologia moderna che prevede un dialogo molto stretto con quella che eh, si usa chiamare letteratura italiana americana cioè la letteratura eh, in lingua inglese scritta da, eh, da autori eh, di origine italiana. Eh, mi fa particolarmente piacere, con questo concludo, che questo convegno cada eh, nel, nel mese del, no, del, dell'Italian Heritage. Eh, e, e quindi a volte, come eh, dice qualcuno, come è il termine della, della parte finale del diavolo in corpo di Radighe, l'ordine circonda spontaneamente le cose, cioè arriva eh, casualmente un ordine e anche dei segnali, insomma, eh, che ci dicono che abbiamo fatto le scelte e le politiche, e le politiche giuste. Noi siamo molto contenti, insomma, dell'impegno del Dipartimento su questo tipo di antologia e ci auguriamo di poterlo sostenere in futuro con altre iniziative che incrocino l'attività di ricerca. Ringrazio la professoressa Canton, che è stata anche nostra ospite, che incrocino l'attività di ricerca eh, con l'attività di, di public engagement, di costruzione di competenze trasversali che per i nostri studenti, per gli studenti dell'Università Italiana, stanno diventando sempre più importanti in materia di competenza digitale. Vi ringrazio e dopo aver ascoltato l'ultima traduzione di Mirko vi lascerò perché abbiamo <laughs> una riunione di dottorato. Yes, very Grazie. briefly, he also, uh, the, 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 the head of the department mentioned also the um, Italian studies program that is a, a, a master's degree program that we have at the University of Calabria. Um, and this is also because of the interest that we have in uh, creating a sort of dialogue, a constant dialogue within between uh, Italy and uh, uh, the Italian communities outside of Italy. And in particular with this MA program, um, we study uh, uh, Italian literature and Italian culture outside of the national borders. And he, he also said that he's very happy that this event is part of the um, um, Italian Heritage Month uh, and uh, the, the Pride uh, Month, International Pride Month. That was just a summary. So, and uh, what I have to say is just to thank you again for your support and for being here with us today. And I know that, as you said, you have to leave because you have another uh, commitment, uh, which is about to begin. So thank you again. Thank you, uh, Rafael. Grazie ancora. Grazie a tutti voi. Un abbraccio e buon lavoro. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Uh, he also quoted Radigue, Le Diablo Corps, but I can't translate that. It was something about, well, order that... Uh, surrounds spontaneously things. And this is something that um, can, I think, describe also what we're doing today. So um, he always has a, 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 a literary quotation, uh, which is like uh, la ciliegina sulla torta, we would say in Italian, the cherry on top of the cake. So thank, thank you, you again. Bye. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, let's go on. Um, and uh, um, I believe that uh, the fact that the, the, the head of the department uh, found the time to introduce this, this meeting uh, tells a lot about how important uh, it is for us at the University of Calabria to support also small projects like this one and to contribute to the, the dissemination of cultural knowledge, not only among uh, Calabrian citizenship, and citizens, sorry, but also uh, abroad. Um, ideally, this is like a sort of bridge, right, between Calabria and Canada, a bridge that has been laid down this afternoon. And uh, speaking of bridges and how they connect points and identities, the fact that this project brings together two fields that are dear to my heart and part of my research interests, namely Italian-Canadian studies on the one hand, and gender and queer studies on the other uh, uh, led me to this collaboration, which actually started a couple of years ago when Licia uh, was writer in residence at the University of Calabria, where she gave a workshop in creative writing. And when Licia introduced me to this project, what impressed me was the fact that um, the anthology not only explores two fields of studies that are usually kept apart, uh, Italian Canadian studies and queer studies, but also that um, it brings together 
different voices sharing a similar background without necessarily knowing that they have so much in common. And uh, in so doing, I believe that a new sense of community emerges, a plurality of identities being queer and Italian Canadian within the plurality of cultures and languages that make Canada unique. And I like the idea that this new literary community is presented to you through the voices of these five others today, as part, as we were saying before, of the Italian Heritage Month and the International Pride Month. But without further ado, I would like to pass the floor to Licia Canton, so the editor of the anthology. Thank you very much, Mirko. Uh, good morning uh, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, thank you, Professor Casagrande, for organizing and hosting this, this event. And uh, grazie al Professor Perelli e al suo Dipartimento dell'Appoggio che ci dà. È un grande piacere per me essere qui con voi oggi. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I am located on unceded indigenous lands. Jojage, Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. We acknowledge them and other nations who care for the land across our country, and we pay our respects to Canada's first storytellers. Um, I just want to remind people that this event is being recorded. I'd like to thank Elan and Nick Maturo for technical support. Uh, if you want to see the person who is speaking, you can go to the top right hand corner where it says view, click there and choose speaker. And that way, every time that somebody new starts to speak, you see them on the screen. All right. Um, before we introduce our writers, I'd like to say a few words about the book. The Queer Italian Canadian Project includes a documentary titled Creative Spaces and the book Here and Now. The volume itself includes the writing of 35 queer Italian Canadian writers and three allies. Um, and it also has a three part introduction by scholars Dominic Beneventi, Michela Baldo, and Paolo Frasca. The queer experience, and by that I mean the experience of members of the LGBTQ community is not traditionally discussed in Italian Canadian households. It's not a topic for Sunday lunch with the whole family. In an attempt to further explore the situation in 2020, I began working on the documentary Creative Spaces. I had initially planned, as some of you know, to interview writers across Canada, but the coronavirus pandemic and the lockdown prevented me and the film crew from traveling and interviewing writers beyond our immediate vicinity in Montreal. And uh, numerous queer Italian Canadian writers and allies came forward uh, or showed interest in our project. And the result is this book. Here and Now, an anthology of queer Italian Canadian writing takes on subjects that are not traditionally discussed in the Italian Canadian community. The vantage point of someone who identifies as gay, lesbian, queer, or transgender, and who is of Italian heritage in Canada may, may be quite different from the mainstream. The volume features short stories, poems, memoir, and excerpts of novels, plays, film scripts in English, uh, with some Italian. Its contributors are established and prize-winning authors as well as emerging writers. This is a groundbreaking volume. Uh, it's the most comprehensive collection yet of queer Italian Canadian writing. It's a milestone in Italian Canadian studies and Canadian literature. Uh, the volume fills a gap within Italian Canadian studies while demonstrating that queer Italian Canadian writers deserve attention and public celebration. Many of these literary artists are already well known in Canadian literary landscape, but they may not be recognized as being of Italian heritage, either by their name like Fox, for instance, or because they have made efforts not to be recognized as being of Italian heritage. This volume encourages the Italian Canadian community to claim these important writers as their own and the field of Italian Canadian studies to formally acknowledge the richness of queer Italian Canadian production. Um, the volume is an essential component of the cultural life of Italian Canadians and it proposes a more complete account of a community's reality, my community's reality. 
The writings in this anthology take readers on a journey that interweaves private and public spaces, eliciting love and anger, laughter and tears. By presenting thoughtful and thought-provoking narratives, Here and Now raises awareness as well as important questions. And I, I think that this is not just a, a volume for uh, literary people or academics or Italian Canadians, it is for the public at large. I was inspired to document the experiences of queer Italian Canadian writers after reading Monica Manigetti's essay titled, I'm Queer and Italian Canadian, Coming Out Was Twice as Hard. That was published in the Globe and Mail in 2018. I hope this volume helps raise sensibilities towards queer identities and realities while expanding the field of Italian Canadian studies. Both the documentary, Creative Spaces, and this volume are useful tools for educators and researchers. There's still a lot of work to be done in this field. In the meantime, I hope that here and now will inspire some change in dinner conversations and lead to more inclusivity. For supporting this volume, I'd like to thank the Queer Studies in Quebec Research Group, the Frank Iacobucci Center for Italian Canadian Studies at the University of Toronto, the University of Calabria, the Association of Italian Canadian Writers, the English Language Arts Network, the Mariano A. Elia Chair in Italian Canadian Studies at York University, Longbridge Books and Accenti Magazine. And there are also a lot of individuals to thank for donating to the book, small amounts and big amounts, and all of those names will be listed in the book. And I take this opportunity since this is being recorded that it's not too late to contribute to the book if you want to support it by making a donation. And it's not too late to order it. And it'll never be too late to order it. I also want to acknowledge the active support of several writers who are in this book. Christopher DiRado and Liana Cusmano, who have organized readings in order to promote the volume ahead of its official launch, which will take place on June 22nd, and which will be hosted by the Frank Iacobucci Center uh, for Italian Canadian Studies at the University of Toronto. June is Italian Heritage Month and Pride Month. And so Anthony Portolese and Liana Cusmano have set up a social media campaign in order to introduce the queer Italian Canadian writers in the volume. So look for Here and Now on Facebook and other social media and, and Liana, perhaps you can indicate those in the chat. Most importantly, Christopher DiRato has also set up a website for the Queer Italian Canadian Project and that is the documentary and the volume. And I thank you, Chris, for that. And you can visit queeritaliancanadian.com and I'll put that in the chat. And uh, now it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Maria Cristina Secha, um, whom I've known since 2010 when she came to one of our conferences in Atri in Italy. And uh, she was a graduate student then. And I'm really happy that we, you know, we, that first meeting has developed into a friendship. Dr. Maria Cristina Secha is currently at the University of Udine working on a project that looks at the representation of motherhood in translated Italian Canadian texts by women writers. She has worked on the Italian translation of Anglophone Italian Canadian literature since 2009 in institutions in the United Kingdom, including the universities of Bangor, Glasgow and Hull, as well as the Institute of Modern Languages Research in London. Her research interests revolve around translingualism, feminist, and post-colonial translation. Dr. Secha joined the AICW executive in 2010 and served as president of the Association of Italian Canadian Writers from 2016 to, two, to 2020. Welcome, Professor Secha. Thank you very much, Lisa. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm very pleased to take part in this international event, which gives visibility to the volume here and now, um, which the AICW is very uh, honored to support. So as a scholar of Italian Canadian literature in translation and as a past AICW uh, president, uh, I would like to highlight how important this anthology is for the AICW, the Association of Italian Canadian Writers, uh, and more generally speaking, uh, to the Italian Canadian literary community. 
Um, so I would like to say just a few words about the association first, just in case some of you have never heard of it. Um, so it's a non-profit organization which brings together not only Canadian writers of Italian origins, as its name might suggest, but also poets and artists whose work reflect the interaction between Canadian and Italian cultures, as well as critics, academics, translators and publishers who work on or promote Italian um, Canadian culture in its different forms. So with a focus on Italian culture, the ACW aims to give voice to one of the several groups which are often uh, called hyphenated, which enrich the Canadian uh, literary and cultural uh, panorama. Uh, and this year, the ACW celebrates its uh, 35th anniversary. Um, indeed, it was founded back in 1986 on the occasion of the first national conference of Italian Canadian writers in Vancouver. And since then, the ACW has played a crucial role in promoting, supporting Italian Canadian literature and arts and literary criticism through the organization of uh, biannual conferences and the publication of, um, of anthologies of literary and uh, critical works. Licha has been one of the most prolific editors of anthologies which um, has, has given voice to the authors, Italian Canadian authors, reflections on their transcultural um, identity. And as I was saying earlier on, uh, the ACW is, is honored, is particularly honored to support um, the anthology here and now, uh, this volume, an anthology of queer Italian Canadian writing, as uh, with the publication of this volume, uh, the Italian Canadian literature is, is taking a step forward by offering, finally offering uh, food for thought, not only about the intersection between different cultures, but also the intersection between transcultural and um, gender identities. Um, indeed, this volume gives voice to uh, multi-generational Italian-Canadian authors who basically, um, as Lisa said, and as we all know, uh, celebrate the diversity and challenge binarism, not only of cultures, but also of, um, of gender identities. And while this had already been done by uh, some Italian Canadian authors in the past few years, their voices had still remained quite um, isolated. And the publication of an anthology, especially in minority contexts, as is often still the case of Italian Canadian literature, is crucial to help these voices to interact with one another, to create a sense of collectivity that's helping them to, to be heard more powerfully. Um, and also this volume is also an opportunity to connect um, academics in time Canadian studies with uh, literary artists and to raise awareness in, in Italian Canadian community in general and, and beyond. So we are very grateful to the contributors uh, of here and now and to Licia um, for taking on this project, which is very timely at a very challenging time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria Cristina Seccia. Um, and uh, it, I'm, it's my pleasure to introduce two of the contributors. Uh, I will begin with Anna. Anna Camilleri has been working with performance, image, and text for over 25 years with professional credits, including book works, performance, and public artworks and installations. Anna Camilleri is founding artistic co-director of multidisciplinary arts organization Redefine Arts, which was established in 2005 as Red Dress Productions. Welcome, Anna. And uh, it's also my pleasure to introduce Frank Canino. Frank Canino's plays have been read, workshopped, and staged in Toronto and across Canada and the United States, including Off Off Broadway. He co-wrote the award-winning film Looking for Angelina, in addition to other film scripts. He has also worked as a director, actor, and stage manager in Canada and the United States. Welcome, Frank Canino. And Frank Canino comes to us from Buffalo. Mirko, I believe you are um, next. Yeah, it is my turn to uh, introduce Liana Cusmano, writer, filmmaker, spoken word artist. Uh, Liana works in English, French, Italian. Liana is the 28 and 2019 Montreal Slam champion and author of the novel Catch and Release, which will be published in 2022. 
Uh, they wrote and directed Matters of Great and Importance in 2018 and La Femme Finale in 2016, screened at the Cannes Film, at the Cannes Film Festival. Um, so um, thank you, Liana, for being here. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce our next writer, uh, Christopher Dirado, who is the author of the novels The Family Way, published, well, this year, 2021. Um, and The Geography of Pluto, which was published in 2014. Um, he lives in Montreal, where he is the founder and host of the Violet Hour reading series and book club. And uh, um, thank you, uh, Chris, for, for being here. Uh, last but not least, Maddie Fox, um, who grew up in Ontario before moving to Montreal and New York, where he received his MA a for the new, from the New School. Uh, he is the author of the short story collection Cities of Weather, 2005, and he now lives in, in Berlin. You are in Berlin right now, right? Uh, where he is writing the novel from which Toronto 1937 is accepted. So these are our five writers today. And uh, before listening to, 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 to their stories, let me remind you that if you want to ask a question, you can type it in the chat. We're going to use the chat for, for questions and we'll read them at the end of the presentations. Yes, so we've asked uh, each of our five authors to read for five minutes. And we'd like you to, you know, if you have a question for an author, hold them until the end and we'll read them all at once. All right, so uh, I'd like to invite Anna Camilleri to read. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing your an, a short excerpt of your text. Thank you. Thank you, Licia. I'm, I'm really happy to be here with all of you. And um, yeah, this is a short excerpt. I'm hard pressed to imagine anyone looking better in our Catholic girls school uniform than MF. Her cropped black hair parted sharply to the left framed her cinnamon skin. Her shirt was impeccably ironed and neatly tucked into her knee length kilt. Most girls didn't wear the tie, it was optional, but MF did and she looked good in it. If MF was in the room, you didn't have to look far to see the redemption. Madonna had just exploded onto the world stage with like a virgin. Our teachers called her a heretical blight on the culture. Many of my classmates accessorized like mini Madonnas with thick black eyeliner, bangles, lace remnants pinned here and there, fingerless gloves, teased hair. Few of us Catholic school girls were like virgins because we actually were virgins. Some who weren't pretended they were. Not being a virgin was cool, but it was also dangerous. Unspecified bad things happened to sluts. We were encouraged to let our imaginations run amok with dreams of ruination, terrible ends, to mistrust one another and to feel absolutely insecure in all situations and in all things, except in the knowledge that we were sinners. It was hard to be hopeful knowing that nothing, not even constant observance could wash away original sin. Our teachers frequently asked, do you want to be an example? or in reference to some kid trying their best to disappear into wall tiles, let her be an example to you. Being an example was not a good thing. It was hard to feel Jesus's unconditional love when surrounded by so many vindictive adults. I remember smoking behind the school. I remember deep fried cafeteria food wafting through the halls. I remember MFN Vedemcion not at school one day or the ones that followed. Later, I heard that a teacher had found them kissing in the locker room. They were escorted out of school and neither one of them ever crossed its threshold again. The odd thing is that no one, not one adult said, let them be an example, as though recognizing their existence in any way might spark a revolt or cast light on a door that had previously been invisible. MF and Redemption were sweethearts and we had all known it in the quiet way that a person knows a thing without being able to name it. Everyone had been fine 
in their presence until our delicate honeycomb of silence was disturbed. The word queer wasn't uttered, but it was in the room. In the months and years that followed, I saw MF and Redemption in the grocery store at the mall, the bank, and then later at the bar, the International Women's Day dance, the meeting. I would speed ahead to say hello, only to discover it wasn't them. Other girls who had disappeared from high school, but it wasn't other girls who had disappeared from high school, but it wasn't until the day MF and Redemption were escorted out that I realized that girls don't slip through cracks. They are pushed through them. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Anna. Um, well, um, you mentioned Madonna. And uh, um, the question actually is not just for you, it's for everybody to, um, to discuss. And so uh, the question is, um, who are the artists, if any, that influenced your, uh, your work and contributed to the definition of your identity as a queer Italian Canadian writer? Uh, thank you, Mirko. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll approach the question. Um, I guess when I, when it, to me, in a way, they feel like two questions, but I, I, I realize they're not. Uh, when I think about who influenced my writing and really the beginning of my practice as a writer, uh, I would say Dorothy Allison, um, like powerfully in, influenced my work. Um, you know, I remember spending time uh, as a 17, 18 year old in an independent women's bookstore in Toronto and kind of hiding out in the stacks and reading uh, reading work and you know there's the possibility of, of the possibility of, of me I guess became alive in that literature in those texts um, so you know I guess I'm reaching back to the beginning uh, the beginning of my writing practice um, for influences thank you um Anybody else that would like to comment on that? Yes, Leanna. One thing that I found interesting is that part of the reason this anthology is such an event and such a landmark publication is because so many of us um, are coming into our identities as queer Italian Canadian writers and learning about one another and meeting one another for the first time. And so a lot of the, the writers um, in this anthology, especially after hearing their work um, and the work and the readings that I've heard are so touching and so heart-wrenching and so beautiful and something that all of us in many ways can relate to. Um, and that's been inspiring and a, a revelation for me because I didn't grow up with queer Italian Canadian writers. I had, those worlds were separate. And so I would read Alison Bechdel's, you know, comics about um, the interior life of a queer person who's closeted and see, you know, and feel a kind of recognition, but also know that there was Madonna and Lady Gaga and Sophia Loren, like that whole Italianita, queer as it was within those artists was separate and also more subtle. And so for me, the inspiration has come from two places and is only starting to intermingle right now. Mm. Yeah, which I think it's, yeah, as you said, it's what the anthology is about, like interweaving these two threads and see, um, I don't know what beautiful tapestry comes out of that. Um, so uh, shall we move on or, uh, Richa? Uh, yes, well, if no one else uh, would like to uh, say, to answer Mirko's question, then I will invite uh, Frank Canino to read from uh, his text. Frank, you have to click, click on the microphone at the bottom left. Frank, Frank, we can't hear you. Ah, uh, there you are. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. 
too okay, many images on the screen. Too start, high tech. Start over because we didn't hear. Okay. We didn't hear what you said. Good. Thank you. I just said hello. Are we ready to go? And uh, I'm going to read three or four very short excerpts from the beginning of my article. It's mostly about the beginning of my early, early years. Um, and then finally a poem about my grandmother because she's still part of me, especially I'm gonna look into the mirror and recognize the beast, okay? Uh, the, the article is simply titled Fragments, B-L-I-B-I-T-W, which stands for best little Italian boy in the world. Okay, this is a rip off from a wonderful book by John Reed, worth looking at someday if you ever have time. Fragments, first memories. I can't remember what I didn't read. When I mentioned this to Aunt Rose, she says, of course, Uncle Joe taught you how to read by the time you were three years old, from newspapers mostly, or when he took you to the racetrack. Thus, I skipped the Dick and Jane stuff which I'm later subject to in grade one in public school, which I find intolerably boring. So how I started. Uncle Joe takes me to the local library. We get a stack of books and he puts them into a little wagon with me. I sit down and I read my first story as we're going home. But one day he dies unexpectedly and he leaves me alone. Bedwetting, stuttering, take, take, take me over. Got that? Still, I'm reading like mad. Anything I can get my hands on. However, in grade one, I am put back at the back of the room because I am a p -p -p problem s student, right? I stutter. However, this reverses when I switch to Catholic school in third grade. The nun librarian tests me by having me read a passage from Little Men. This is the first publication before, uh, after Little Women, I should say. She promptly gives me permission to take any book out of the school library and a new life begins for me. Early scholar. I continue to read De Montpassant, Chekhov, O. Henry, et cetera, at Shakespeare, Dickens, and Dostoevsky for a fun reading life. Then one day, I somehow discover the word homosexual. A dictionary is no help. So I desert the literature section of the library and search social sciences. I quickly learn to look under the H at the back of the book, the index, right? There I find a 1950s or earlier description of a typical homosexual. What a revelation, except I don't fit any, well, or at least most of the scientific verbiage. I feel isolated, utterly alone. I am an outcast who will never fit into any club. That was the beginning, it gets worse, okay? about my grandmother, Nona, who made me. Titter totter, here's my grandmother lurching down the hallway. She leaves monkey prints on both walls. Balancing precariously like a drunken tightrope walker and behind her small puddles of pee, says the doctor, you know, after 14 children, your plumbing gets loose. I have to turn off the telephone, excuse me. Okay. okay. So much for high tech. Where was I? Oh yes. She's behind her small puddles of pee. The doctor says, you know, after 14 children, your plumbing gets loose. And the smell of her, dry, acrid, like nothing else I know. Her skin hangs in shrouds. She's an unwrapped mummy covered in dry parchment. Orenta, sorda, she bellows and she echoes the rent, the money, the rent, the money. It's her only vocabulary since her strokes. Oh no, she's not Grandma Moses. 
no smiles, no hugs for me or anyone. In the hospital, years later, she wakes up astonished. How did they smuggle her into this white box of a room? They knocked her out, of course, some with pills and God knows what else. Bellowing again, she rips open the oxygen tent and dies of a heart attack. Ecola, the last relentless rage of a survivor. That's where I come from. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Frank, um, for taking us back to um, your actually memory lane, I think, right? And uh, I think that memory plays a fundamental role in uh, several stories included in the, um, in the anthology. So how important is individual and collective memory to give voice to your present identity as queer Italian Canadian writer or as writer or artists in, in, in general? Uh, very simply, I spent the first 30 years more of my life denying I was Italian. I had no memories. The memories I had were problematic. Uh, I came from two very different families. I think they represent the span of Italian ad adaptation when the immigrants came to the United States and Canada. I was the confused product that said, I don't do Italians. That was one of my famous statements at one point in the game. Uh, which has been requoted to me many times by friends, et cetera. So the, it was as if I denied there was a memory. So I had to go back and refine the memory as I was rewriting, especially the Angelina, the play first and then the film. And then it became like an avalanche of memory. Most of it's, not a lot of it, very painful, very painful, but real and immediate. And I feel that now it's like a, a resource I can you know, draw on. So memory, finally, delayed, but good. Echo. Yeah, so it's like a way to you know, um, overcome a sort of trauma, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, remembering as mm -hmm. a way of yeah. moving forward, so somehow. Yeah, well, memory becomes, for, I think for a writer, for me, this very mixed, very happy, very disturbing, upsetting, uh, uh, inspiring, uh, uh, frightening. You know, do I remember? Do I remember accurately the fact when I remember, for instance, the first years I spent in Toronto, where I joined every gay group possible. There were like eight of them. I belonged to all of them for a while, and they went from the extreme of you know uh, a group called Chat where the guys sat around and knitted and talked about their cats and opera. And at the other extreme was Gate, G-A-T-E. And they were all kind of, they were very young. They were very white. They were not Italian. Uh, there were no women. Lesbians didn't exist, remember? You're not on the chart yet. You, you come in later, et cetera. Uh, and so it's, there's a lot of confusion about distinguishing which memories and how do I use what I can remember and it took a lot of years to kind of, you know, absorb, assimilate, and then put into some of my writing. Yeah, and I think that it doesn't matter if it's, if in, in the end it's not real. I mean, if that memory is not necessarily real, but it's just sort of yeah. uh, real you're, for you, I mean, in, from the inside, so to speak. You're recreating. Mm, I, it's I a representation. When I write a play, it's a beautiful lie. Some of it is very true. Mm. Some of it is very, you know, uh, uh, I'm stealing from him, I'm stealing from her, I'm adding this extra thought or line, whatever. Pl all playwrights are essentially liars. Yeah. It's also a way to make sense of, of someone's past, I guess. I hope. Through, through um, yeah, lies sometimes as well. Right. Um, okay. Um, no other questions? No one has a lawyer for a cousin. <laughs> when, when I want to ask a question, I think of one of my cousin's lawyers and I automatically a question forms, you know. I think they actually have roots in the, in the Inquisition. Yeah, I think that these general questions are sort of, you know, an intermezzo between one writer and the other. Maybe the, the, I'm pretty sure that there will be more questions at the end. 
Right. So let's say that after, yeah, act one and two, maybe it's time. Um, because yes. Licha actually came up with a very neat and uh, precise script. So let's stick to that. And well, uh, but I mean, I mean, it's 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 uh, fluid, right? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But yes. So I I would invite Liana to read now. Yeah. I'll Liana. An excerpt from a piece in the anthology. I've gone to family events in my binder and my tie, and it was fine. My grandfather was excited that I wore his tie, but others were less excited. Expressing my queerness in a private setting still felt public and exposed. As a queer person, the safest that I have felt has been while writing, because there is nobody, there is no one and nothing that will judge me or threaten my safety just for writing about it. When I was younger and in the closet, I was afraid that I would be ridiculed, humiliated, or threatened. Writing about my queerness had none of those risks. Exploring and expressing my feelings privately eventually gave me the courage to share them publicly on a stage and to an audience. As a child, when I told my parents and teachers that I wanted to be a writer, I was still projecting that image of an artist that I had been taught, the romanticized inhabitant of a cold mm -hmm. flat who writes down their heightened interpretations of real life in a way that brings them joy and pride and recognition. The concepts of a linear professional and academic progression, stable employment, the nuclear family, all of those milestones have been frustrated and redefined. And this includes the definition of a writer. That being said, I cannot imagine myself not writing. It has always been a passion, a need and a basis for community. My spoken word poetry has allowed me to explore and express what it means and how it feels to come into myself, to be who I am. Writing poetry helps me to find courage when something as simple as a glance or a touch feels like it can knock me off my feet. I have read my writing and performed poetry at small literary venues in North America, Europe, and Asia, and I have competed on the national spoken word scene in Canada. Before the COVID-19 pandemic, I was scheduled to represent Canada at the international spoken word competition in Paris. I performed my writing at Montreal's Pride as part of Place à la Relève in 2019. To share my work with an audience in a small cafe in front of a crowd at a large outdoor event has been, and I think always will be, terrifying, exhilarating, and deeply fulfilling. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, all these hands make uh, you know, no sound. So, but it's like, yeah. Um, th thank you, Liana. Um, so, um, well, you mentioned, um, you know, the, the, the private and public space, family and uh, uh, community, and uh, how writing can be also a, a sort of a form of activism. So, uh, thinking about the queer community in Canada, how has activism changed over the years and have those changes also uh, been reflected in, uh, uh, well, in your writing, but also in everybody uh, else's writing here? I think that especially as someone who's queer and as a queer person who can benefit from a certain platform or a certain amount of visibility, and I'm thinking particularly about um, spoken word circles and small hipstery indie cafes that are largely populated by young queers with you know, purple hair, um, who sort of seems to come out of the woodwork um, and who will come up to poets after performances and say, I'm also queer, or I'm also Italian Canadian, or I'm also queer and Italian Canadian, and I've never seen anything like that before, or this is my first slam and I wasn't sure if I belonged here but now I know that I do and I think I might perform next time. I think that in itself is a form of activism and spoken word has its roots in um, African-American culture and traditions. It's something that goes back a very, very long time across a variety of, of communities and peoples and groups. And so the way that it has traveled and been transformed over time today and the way that it has its place in different communities and in different marginalized communities I think is all a part of activism. Activism is protests and rallies and um, legislation, but it's also small individual encounters where someone will leave you know, their home in the suburbs and go to like a lesbian bar to listen to a poetry slam and 
realize that the personal is political. And I think that that's, that's activism as well. I think sometimes we underestimate that. Yeah, I agree that personal is political, especially um, when um, your contribution through your um, art, whatever form that art takes actually um, is, is is a way to contribute to um, well being active, not, uh, being an activist not only within your uh, community uh, circle but also uh, outside of things. So yeah, thank you. Um, any other comment? I, I was just going to say that you know um, you know the piece that I'm going to be reading is talks a little bit about you know early days of activism you know like um, mm. I got involved in the 90s and it was very very different. Yeah, I remember our pride was really just gay and lesbian, right? Like that was kind of like how we we talked about the community and and in terms of how activism has changed in Canada, it is very much more intersectional now. I think you know that's something that I think a lot of us um, are hyper aware of now and weren't at the time. And I feel like even talking about queer and Italian Canadian, right? Like there's that intersection that like, I'm almost 50 years old. I don't think it's ever really something that I ever really thought would ever kind of cross. So I, I think this anthology is a form of activism too, I think, and, and the documentary that um, Leach has produced, I think um, it's just giving a voice to another part of the community, not the kind of, not the kind of community that's always been centered kind of in all discussions for, since the beginning of gay liberation, but I think now we're hearing from a variety of different kind of voices, and um, I find that personally quite exciting. Yeah, and uh, you're right, and I think that it's also interesting to see how, uh, I mean, there was a sort of binary system within the the the, the gay and lesbian community before, and now we're sort of moving beyond that binary system within the community uh, itself. And uh, uh, yeah, the examples that you brought are. Um, show show that also um, uh, within the the the, the anthology and uh, um, the the stories and all the texts that are collected there. So yeah, definitely. Hi, uh, Anna speaking. Um, yeah, when I think about my my art practice, uh, certainly what underpins all of the work that I've created is a real desire. Uh, is informed by my desire for systemic changes. Um, you know, whether that's work that I've created individually or collectively, um, you know, within kind of larger multi-year projects. Uh, and also I recognize that still today, um, you know, I have this experience of people saying to me, I'm also Italian and queer, you know, in this whispered kind of voice. And so I realized that you know, despite the fact that I've been making art for 25 years and much has changed, there there is still this, like just the presence of me and, and others like me is significant to people who are Italian descended and queer or Italian descended and trans that there is something about, you know, the, the impossibility or the intelligibility of, you know, of these identities, you know, intersecting. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm kind of coming at that question in a couple of different ways. Yeah, and I think that is, it is about intersecting, but it's also um, the idea of, mm, well, fluidity, you know, because it's not a fixed and stable identity. Um, so it, it's, interesting to see how it evolves over over the years for not only for the for the community the way it represents itself uh, but also for each of us I guess that the way we identify is is always on the move so somehow yes. it's always in the making it's not yeah. stable and um, um, I like the fact that the anthology somehow uh, brings this also together and shows several refractions of this um, uh, identity in the making, as as we were saying before. So yeah. Shall we move along to um, Chris? Chris is um, will be reading. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, all right, so yeah, as I mentioned 
uh, just earlier piece that I'm going to read from here. This is an essay that I wrote that is about pictures that I've taken at various gay prides over the years. I've been going to gay prides for a very long time since the 90s. And we take a lot of photos, or at least I did. And, um, you know, when we're talking a bit about memory, there are often a lot of memories associated with these photos. So I'll be reading just a, from the beginning of it from the first photograph. Um, there is this picture of me taken at my first gay pride parade that is one of my favorites. In it, I'm wearing a vintage red and white baseball t-shirt, ironically, of course, and a black sports cap. I must have been about 20 years old at the time, but I look years younger. I'm standing in the center of the photo, my skinny left hand grasping the straps of a tiny blue backpack, and my eyes are closed, having just blinked the moment the picture was taken. When I look back at the photo now, though, some 26 years later, I wonder if I was blinking. For all around me, there is color and commotion, balloons, bodies, faces, smiles. Perhaps it wasn't a blink. Perhaps as I stood there in the center of all that raging chaos, I was blinded by brilliance, joyful, beautiful brilliance. I had arrived. I say this was my first gay pride parade, but it really wasn't. I had passed by on my own the previous year. I had read about the Diversité Pride Parade in the Montreal Mirror, seen the photocopied route of the cache of a bar I had darted into the week before. Almost on autopilot, I woke up that Sunday morning, got dressed and left the house, not admitting to myself where I was going. I rode the subway into town and then got off one stop before the departure point. Once outside, I walked towards the noise. I headed north along St. Denis Street and then west along Mount Royal to the escalating sounds of music, microphones, and motors. I'd never seen these streets close to traffic before, but here they were, a concrete carpet that had been rolled out and lay waiting for the city's gay community. I walked the route in reverse and came across more and more people as I did. People with props, wigs, costumes, friends, all heading in the same direction as me. Afraid to go too far, I stopped at one of the corners and, emboldened by the men and women beginning to gather at the sidewalks, waited with them to see what all the fuss was about. Little did I know how much was about to change. I'm no stranger to parades. I grew up on Montreal's St. Patrick's Day Parade, the cold green pageant of the city's Irish and Irish for a day. Every year, my family would gather on the corner of St. Catherine and University with spiked coffee and apples and watch the marching bands and horses pass. There would be many photos taken here, too, of friends and family, of strangers and shamrocks. Montreal is a city that loves its St. Patrick's Day, and that included my family. Even my dad, a proud Italian, would, sport a happy, would happily sport a green derby hat and a Kiss Me I'm Irish badge as he cheered from the sidewalk. But even though I'm half Irish, I didn't get it. I didn't understand how a city or a person's love of all things Irish. How could I be born? How could I be proud of? How could I be proud of how I was born? And what was it about this parade and all of its cliches, the green, the gold, the leprechauns? It felt like being made to sit through church, like I was being forced to take part in the rituals and sacraments of a congregation that was not my own. This other parade spoke to me, so strange yet so familiar, it was as if I had come upon my likeness in a window and watched as that boy sat down to eat with his, another family. Everything was so loud, so tall, so large that I felt dwarfed by it all. How could I have lived in this city for two decades and not know that this was going on? And how great would it be to be one of those people, one of the proud ones walking down the street before the, all, all the onlookers? When the parade had finally passed me by, I followed it the rest of the way down. I wasn't bold enough to walk into the street with the rest of the in the street with the rest of the contingent, so I walked alongside it on the sidewalk. I followed the parade as it snaked through town, down Mount Royal Street to St. Denis, down St. Denis to Cherrier, and then along Cherrier to Parc La Fontaine. At that point, the trucks the trucks broke off, but everyone else kept walking. I followed them into the park, still very much a passerby and watched as they arrived at their final destination and began to break off into groups to drink beer, eat hot dogs, listen to music and dance. I looked at my watch. I was late. I was scheduled to meet my friends at a pub downtown for our Sunday afternoon ritual, cheap, cheap chicken wings and a deep bowls of sangria. But as I stood there in the wake of what I had just witnessed, I found that I could not move. I stood immobile in the grass in the center of this park we had all ended up at and watched as everyone celebrated. My watch felt heavy. I didn't want to leave, but I had no reason to stay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you. Um, again, uh, memory, activism, there are uh, all these topics um, uh, intertwined in several stories. Um, and uh, um, well, in your case, also your uh, 
Irish part, let's say the, the, the Irish heritage. So uh, even another uh, culture. Uh, and I know Matthew is as well. So Matthew is also half Irish, so it's, it's kind of fun. Yeah. yeah. And uh, um, so um, thinking about uh, cultures and languages, scholars often point out that being Canadian means to constantly translate oneself into someone else's language and culture. And um, do you feel uh, that you had, or still have maybe, to translate your queerness to the Italian Canadian community? Yeah, yes. I, you know, it's funny, like I've written two novels or published two novels and both of them, the, like the first one, the Italianist was very kind of buried. And then the second one, it was, it's kind of there, but doesn't kind of address it fully. And I realized that I was afraid to translate my queerness to Italians. I, I never really thought of the Italian community as my readers, um, uh, Italian Canadian community as our readers. And I realized through this project with Licia um, that I was wrong. Like, you know, that there, I made a lot of assumptions. Um, I feel like even in general, in my own kind of personal life with my family, I made a lot of assumptions about how my Italian family would accept my queerness. Um, you know, so I kind of didn't really care if they came to my book launch or, you know, cause I just, I felt like these were separate worlds. And, and I realized that that was, that was wrong of me to do that. Cause I, I, I didn't give them credit for, you know, and, and I found that in a lot of ways they were very welcome. And in most ways actually, they were very welcome. So I feel like I still have a lot to, to say then because um, I feel comfortable now. I think this anthology and the documentary and this experience has made me realize that like, I do feel comfortable um, speaking about my queerness to an Italian Canadian audience. So, um, and I feel like I've only just begun. Like, I feel like, you know, I think there are, I've been very inspired by it. So I see that there's a lot of kind of other opportunities or other kind of roads that I want to be able to pursue with this subject matter. Yeah. Thanks. Um, um, I would jump in and say that uh, the, <laughs> I have written this book that is explicitly about um, queerness and being Italian. And it's a, it's a series of short stories and I'll read from one in a sec. Um, and they're all connected. They're all about one Italian Irish family, but mostly on the Italian side. And I can tell you that even though my family has been extremely welcoming, I have a gay sister as well. And it's been, it's been a surprisingly welcoming, um, environment. I'm terrified of publishing this novel. <laughs> um, because I just, it, the whole conceit of the book is that it, it reimagines all the stories, the family stories that we've told ourselves over the years, you know, the mythology that is now like set in stone. And um, the, the narrator just goes back and tries to take it all apart and um, because it has never really made sense to him. Um, and yeah, I have literally no idea what my, what my family's gonna think when this, if they ever read this thing. Yeah, also because I, I think that you don't necessarily write for, you know, for your family or for your community, you write for like uh, an extended audience, which occasionally m may also be like part of your uh, smaller community. But it's interesting, let's say, to, to um, To see, uh, maybe in this case, translation becomes a sort of metaphor for, uh, yeah, coming out. It's like a sort of um, expressing that to, um, yeah, as we were saying before, your family and your Italian Canadian community, but not necessarily. You might also feel uh, that, that that's not something uh, that you need to to do through your white through your writing, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm very curious to see what the reaction will be to the book, to be honest. I mean, we've been talking about it for a very long time, and I feel like it is addressing a, 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 a desire for people to hear these stories. So I can't wait for the reviews. I can't wait for your interviews, Licha, you know, as, the, as like the editor. Um, and just to, kind of, yeah, to also hear from readers. Like, I feel like that's, like, we're talking. Uh, you know, but I don't think none of, well, some of us have read some of each other's work, but I think, you know, this will be, it'll be really great once we're able to all read each other's work and then actually have conversations about the texts that are inside and also to hear from other people too, what they think. And I think there's just so many more conversations 
to have. Yeah, I agree. I, I think it's just the beginning. And I, I don't know if you noticed, I think I sent it to you, Chris, and I may have posted it. Uh, the um, Corriere Italiano in Montreal, which is an Italian language weekly, they did a whole page on the book or, or, or the fact that this book is being uh, prepared. And they talked about the documentary as well. So Italian uh, readers know about this book because they all read, you know, th this, this paper. Uh, I mean, I, you know, my social media handles, I'm followed by a lot of Italians, older Italians as well. So, you know, so far, those who have written to me have been supportive, but I guess it is those who are supportive who write to you, right? Um, but uh, I think there, there'll be a lot, a lot of conversations going forward. And um, I think, uh, yeah, we'll see. And, and it will be wonderful to have uh, longer events or more events with longer readings so that everyone can get a chance to, so far, I think you've been getting a chance to hear the reading, to hear the text through the events that uh, you've organized, that we've organized, yeah. So I, I think we should, uh, Matthew, would you like to read your excerpt? Sure. So as I said, this is uh, an excerpt from uh, the novel and stories that I've written. Um, so just for a bit of context, <laughs> um, this concerns um, a story of two friends uh, who are 19 year old girls and it takes place in 1937. Um, they're from a small town uh, in Ontario and they've traveled to the big city, which is Toronto. Uh, and one of them knows of a, of a secret gay bar and takes her friend there. At 8 p.m. the music changed. Everyone stood and helped clear the furniture to the margins of the room. Dancing, Martina said, handing Angelica her beer before dragging their table aside. Martina immediately took charge of this operation, ordering others to pile chairs on top of other chairs, barking precautions about the candles and the ashtrays. To her, this was the main event, not the dancing, which was starting up around them, the women paired up with each other. The notion of swaying with Martina's fingers on her hips, the two of them in coordination, was appealing to Angelica. Here, it was sanctioned. Here was outside of reality, or rather, this was outside of that other reality. She was coming to understand that there were zones of realness, levels of realness, and it was bewildering that they existed in such shocking proximity. Maybe we should go, Angelica said, get back to the truck and drive home. Nah, said Martina, but come on, it'll be dark before long. Just one song, Angel. Martina said. Angelica protested, even as they were already moving together to a flighty clarinet. She danced with her sister and her mother before at weddings, but this was a different sort of motion. Martina was a terrible dancer with one awkward hand on Angelica's hips. They moved uncomplicatedly, shifting their weight from one foot to another. There was a heat in the gap between them pouring up over Angelica's face. Angelica was taller, so she had to look down at Martina, whose brown eyes flashed vulnerability from the newness of this movement. Martina was unsure for once. She still smelled of cheap soap, but of beer too, and smoke. It didn't feel as though they could get any closer, but they did. Angelica felt the hard curves of Martina press into her flesh, her body making room. The awkward hand moved to Angelica's back, Martina's black floss of hair tickled Angelica's nose when it tipped back, showing her entire face, moony and tan with round cheeks and a hungry underbite. Angelica dug her fingers into Martina's shoulders and could feel a nervousness there in the muscle, a slight rumble like the early signs of a volcano's eruption. And that's what Angelica wanted suddenly, an eruption, something destructive and hot, beautiful and unavoidable the surging of molten material that could no longer be contained. It felt real. And if it did, maybe it was. What if it was? What if it was not sealed off in some room of permission? If it was real, then it was visible, visible from, from heaven, that's for sure. The contents of her desire were visible. 
What was about to happen was visible. She was watched. That familiar shame started to stir in her, an awareness of offense, a mechanical trigger of responsibility. You got yourself here, Angelica thought. You did it. You made it possible. You made the arrangements. You're at risk. This can't be undone. The song ended, their movement ended. The possibility that it opened up now closed on a final chord. Angelica stepped back, air came between them. Martina stared at her. Her face was similar to every Italian woman Angelica knew, the black hair, the round eyes, the dark slashes of eyebrow, but it shielded an intensity and expectation that Angelica had never before detected beyond those familiar features. Next time, Martina said, and put on a sad smile. Angelica looked at her in horror and said nothing. She pictured their truck, the highway, their small town and home. And she thought, Martina really thinks there will be a next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Um, Thank you very much. Um, so uh, I think that now it's time for questions from the floor. Right, Licha? Yes. yes. And uh, I mean, uh, questions. you can also turn, I mean, you can ask the questions directly. You don't necessarily need to type the questions in. Uh, are they able to unmute? Um, um, well, raise your hand if you have a question and I'll, I or Nick will unmute you. What uh, I can do is I can, I can allow everybody to unmute themselves now. I had it turned off during the, the presentation, but I'll just, I'll give everybody that, that ability right now. Bear with me one moment. Thank you, Nick. So in the meantime, I'll just want to invite you to the official launch of the anthology here and now, which is on June 22nd at 5 p.m. Eastern Time, Toronto, Montreal Time. And I've just put the link to Eventbrite. You need to register for the event. It is free and you will receive a link to join us. Uh, and at that event, we'll have uh, uh, the academics, um, the three writers of the introduction and a few readings as well. So it'll be every event is totally different because the participants are different and the questions are different. We also have on... Um, this coming Saturday, eight writers participating in the Canadian Association for Italian Studies. Um, and uh, they'll get a chance to read five minutes and we'll also have some questions. That is part of a, an annual uh, academic conference and they've, they've given us space to have a round table discussion. So I'm grateful for that. Mirko. Yep. What? <laughs> Yes. Maybe. Um, yeah, Anthony has a question. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I can't see that. Thanks for the great readings today. They were really a pleasure and a lot of fun to listen to. My question is specifically for Matthew, just because I'm curious. I'm someone who really enjoys reading, writing historical fiction. And I don't want to necessarily put what you just read for us in that camp, but the fact that you said it's situated in the late 1930s in Toronto, in my head instinctually, I'm thinking within that lens. I'm wondering if, like where that type of story comes from for you. I'm just curious what inspired the creation of those characters or sure. putting it in that setting, in that environment. So the, as I was sort of mentioning before, um, I have this novel that I've written that's like structured around short stories. And um, the narrator basically takes all of the, stories that his family's been telling for years and um, investigates them and sh shows them as it moves back in time, actually. So it starts in 2001, and just disappears back in time. And there's a story from like the 30s in, in, in Italy, in Abruzzo. And there's a story from the 60s uh, in, in a small town on Lake Huron. And so um, it just unpacks all of these things. And the story that, um, that I read um, comes from like sort of the, the linchpin story that links them all together. Uh, and for me, it was a necessary part of the narrative. I, I didn't set out to write something uh, 
that, that was historical. But um, once I got into it, I was researching all the details and like it just, there was an overwhelmingly, uh, an overwhelming amount of detail to, to want to include because it was just so interesting to me. Um, reading about all these old, you know, secret gay bars in Toronto and um, just exploring what that was like. So um, yeah, I guess the answer is I didn't set out to write something historical, but it ended up being a really big part of the of the narrative. So um, yeah, I had to do the research to fit it in. Perfect, thanks so much. Man. Please go mm -hmm. ahead if you raise your hand, if you have a question. Yeah. Or if any of the authors have questions, no, yeah. the others. Um, Valeria Russo, who is a yes. PhD. I, I don't know how to book a question on well, just, Zoom. I'm just, sorry. Just but... where you're, yeah, it's, it's just fine. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And I don't want to monopolize, you know, the debate with my question because I took lots of notes. Uh, I will uh, ask two questions to all of you, to all the contributors. And one is maybe you are going to correct me on a certain feeling I have, and it's about. Well, I've, I've got the feeling that sometimes in communities, national communities abroad, the issue of stereotypes is even stronger. And I'm referring to the fact that maybe in the Italian communities abroad, um, stereotypes about, about heteronormativity is stronger than maybe sometimes in some um, context in Italy. I'm referring to a certain machismo or about the portrayal of women about being always mothers and wives, or maybe is it something about uh, religion which is rooted and symbolic in your community? If, even if you're not attending the mass every Sunday, but maybe it is symbolic for your context, for the context you live in. And the second question is about a little bit more technical one about the genre, the textual genre you decide to pick. Uh, what if you are more comfortable within a certain genre in, or another? Or, and is it because maybe uh, choosing to write a poem or a short story uh, is more comfortable in exposing your activism or is it just because of your, your artistic needs? And it, it's to all of you, feel free to answer I don't want it to become too personal. <laughs> so feel free to, to give me your opinions on that. Thank you. But thank you to all of you. Who wants to start? So let's start with the first question then. Because uh... On stereotypes? Hmm. I feel like... Um, <laughs> Stereotypes have a way of like surviving and and um, evolving um, and sticking sticking with us. Um, but I, when you were asking your question, I uh, I actually thought about stereotypes in the other direction. I think about my grandmother, um, and she just had all of these opinions about what she would call white people. Mm -hmm. um, and she's just Italian, but she's like she would never. She always thought she was like, oh, tarragon. That's a white person uh, spice or something like that. Like she, and it and it's it 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 worked both ways. At least when I was growing up, I um, I remember thinking that oh, I have to think in this one set of perceptions when I'm at school or whatever, and then there's another set of perceptions about all those non-Italians out there that I'm supposed to keep in keep in mind keep in mind when I'm with my Italian family. Uh Valeria, your, your question is really interesting. Uh, your, your first question. Um, I think, um, you know, Mirko uh, earlier referenced that, you know, identities are not fixed. They, they continue to change uh, over a lifetime and in communities. But, you know, my experience, and, I, and I'm, I'm sure this is shared, is that, you know, the Italianness that my family pointed to was there was a suggestion that it was fixed, that there was a certain standard, there was something to meet that was like, this is what Italian is, this is what you must be, this is what we are, as though that identity or these identities are fixed. And, and I think that, um, you know, the, the point of reference or the cosmology that was being pointed to was 1950s, um, uh, small village outside of uh, Napoli, 
identity that was fixed there. You know, meanwhile, you know, uh, culturally the family has changed. You know, the the work has changed. They, um, a lot has changed. But there's this reference that was like the North Star that was constantly being pointed to. And I guess for me, that's been part of my navigation and my own understanding and unraveling of you know, how I understand Italianness and queerness, that I've had to kind of travel through this net of filters that, you know, I've determined is there's, there's truths and there are untruths and there are just simply, you know, understandings that have nothing to do with, with truth <laughs> or what is actually real. It's just what's held up as what's real. Um, yeah. Also, yeah. because that's, I think that the, 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 the picture of uh, the, the image or the memory of Italy as it was in the past, but the, the idea that it's not, it's always there, it's always the same. Whereas yeah. of course, um, well, the, the mother country uh, changes over the decades. And the, the interesting thing is that it changes also because of the influence of the new world, so to speak, right? So what happens in, in North America in Canada and the US uh, for us uh, in Italy. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I think that this is particularly true for uh, queer studies as well. I mean, I, I mean we, we borrow a lot from, you know, uh, queer studies in North America to define uh, uh, and queer studies in Italy. So that there is this constant exchange, let's say, between, well, the two sides of the pond, as they, as they say. And, uh, yeah. Sorry. I was just going to add... Um, uh, I, I like this question and it's interesting to me too to think about it because like for instance like my grandparents were the ones who came over from Italy it wasn't my parents right so mm -hmm. there was already this like step removed <clears throat> and my grandparents also died when I was very young so I never really got to, to meet them so a lot of my notions about Italian culture came from pop culture I guess and also came from the family around me like my uncles and my aunts and um, and being in Canada I felt very different in school. Like, you know, it's weird. Like I got body hair before everybody, right? Like, you know, and it was one of these things that was like extremely traumatizing to me because it made me more different than mm -hmm. I was, I wanted to be. And so I feel like that to me made me also push my, my you know, Italian identity away a little bit too, because I wanted to assimilate. I wanted to be part of like this broader kind of like Italian, uh, sorry, Canadian culture that like, you know, my friends in my class, I already felt this difference. And, you know, the Italian-ness of my family felt sometimes performative, right? Like we had flags in the bar downstairs, right? And we had like, you know, we made our own wine or, you know, there was, we had pasta dinner and stuff like that. Um, that my friends really wanted to come for dinner though, I have to say, like they all really wanted to come for dinner. Mm. But um, I was a victim of that stereo, the, the stereotype. And um, uh, and I, I, like I said, it was only kind of really recently that I realized that I didn't, I mean, not that I, I felt that they're like, you know, Italian people were all kind of like one way, but I just, I guess it was such a, a big part of my youth that like, I just, it's same with the Irish side of me too, which I kind of get at in, in the story that I'm reading. I, you know, queerness was the identity that I gravitated toward more than any other kind of other identity. And I never thought I could be all three things or both things or, or whatnot. So, um, and I'm kind of think hoping that like this, at least in terms of like, for me, it's just really great. Like I said, this intersectionality, just to see how broad queer Italian Canadian experiences can be, you know, um, I think it'll, 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 like I said, start a bunch of conversations and I'm happy, I'm happy to be involved in that. Mm -hmm. And the second question, right? Valeria's second question. I think for me, jumping between genres is still something that I haven't nailed down for myself as a writer. It's still very, very intuitive. It's very much a feeling of, okay, this feels like a poem. And usually if I'm stuck on something, if I have an idea and I, I have trouble expressing it, it's often because I'm not in the right genre. It's not in the right form yet. So I try to toggle between them until I find something that works. Poetry and spoken word is obviously a little bit more accessible um, and easier to perform and to promote and to share than let's say screenwriting or filmmaking. 
because not all of us have the means to realize all of our projects exactly the way we would want to and as quickly as we would want to. So in that sense, I think accessibility is very important. Um, and there's something to be said for those of us who have the time and luxury um, or the grant or the motivation or just the means and the circumstances and opportunities to choose one form or one genre over another. So I think that's a, a consideration as well, but it remains still very intuitive. Like, oh, this just, this feels like a poem. Um, the words will sound better to me if I say them out loud than if I assume that the reader will just read them by themselves. It's very intuitive. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I'm, I'm intimidated by poetry. <laughs> I wish that I, I, you know, it's funny, I just got invited to, to to submit a poem to something and I'm like, oh my God, no, I can't do that. Um, I'd love to be able to do that, but it, you know, for me, like, I feel like it's like fiction or nonfiction is the things that I try to like, that, you know, try to figure out, am I gonna tell the truth about something or am I gonna fictionalize it? And um, I guess, you know, that's where, you know, I don't know, some things just end up having to be fiction because they didn't happen, but they're in, maybe inspired by something that happened. Like the, the the essay that I wrote in the anthology about parades, like it was very clear to me. I had this like vision of all these photos and I wanted to write about these photos. So it had to be nonfiction. Um, I, yeah, I, I've never really thought about it in that way, but thank you for the question. And what about experimenting with more than one genre within the same text? That could also be a way to, I don't know. My next story, like I'm actually, I'm writing a, a character who writes poetry. And so that's gonna be a real challenge for me because like, I'm really intimidated by that. Um, uh, yeah, I guess, you know, yes, you could totally do a hybrid, um, a hybrid work. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So other questions from, from the floor? I have a question very quickly. Um, Steve Galucho, in his contribution to the volume, uh, says that his parents were a lot more worried about him being a writer than him being gay. And I was wondering if you had any, you know, if, what your experience uh, was when you when you your family discovered that you were going to pursue writing and, and saying this I'm assuming that I'm assuming and maybe incorrectly so that most of the contributors in the anthology are doing creative writing and not living off of it if you want to answer if not that's okay well, for me, my, uh, my mom, uh, my parents are retired now, but my mom was a kindergarten teacher and my dad was an editor, a newspaper editor. So being a writer, I think it was something they probably would have preferred that I didn't do, but um, they were very encouraging. And um, yeah, I think that they were a little bit more taken aback um, by me being gay, uh, especially since my older sister is also gay. So it was a double whammy for them, two Christmases in a row. <laughs> uh, can I add a note here that this is, okay. Yes. The, the Italian immigrant obsession with job, the job. Was it in uh -huh. Christ and concrete is that denote, that job is like the sacred word. And I somehow, what I vaguely remember growing up what little feedback I got from my uncles and aunts and et cetera, was that, but what are you gonna do for a job? How are you going to survive? It was about survival. And both families, that my father's and father mothers had very different stories. My mother's had a relatively easy adaptation, kind of all the good stuff that could happen. And they live in a nice house with a little pond and they go to Reno, you know, Nevada twice a, a year, et cetera. And the other family is filled with disasters and m money and more disaster and people getting killed. You know, one of my uncles was the bodyguard to Capone. And my aunt grew up with this person who supposedly was in business 
but as it turned out, his business was protecting Capone and family. And he ended badly, he got shot, et cetera. So there's this kind of uh, schizophrenic thing of, can you latch on to some immediate reality? Here is a job and it's going to give you security and a pension. That's all you worry about. And at the other extreme, if you don't do this, you are lost because somehow you don't belong to this American culture where you're going to, your son will be a lawyer and the daughter is going to become a doctor. And that's too distant, too difficult, too complicated. So the kind of, uh, the, the way you resolve it is what is the safest way I can live? And that is my memory of growing up as a very young person in Chicago. What kind of security, job equals security, security counts above everything and anything else. That's the end of the sermon. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you. Oh, sorry, Anna, go ahead. No, Chris, Christopher, just, go ahead. I'll just say quickly, I, I totally agree. It was the same kind of thing. I think parents just want you to be settled and and secure. Um, secure. secure. But I have to say, when I did publish my first book, I felt like it was one of these moments where they were like, really? Like you published something? Like, like it was yeah. almost like Mm -hmm. you said you wanted to do something and you and you did it like not in a and not in a way that they didn't believe in me but it just felt like such a weird thing to say I want to be a writer like even with my friends too sometimes it's like I want to be a writer and then all of a sudden you're getting an invitation to a book launch and you're like wow you, you did it like you know so I think there's also kind of that disbelief too that like even though you know you didn't make it or you're living you were still able to kind of produce become the thing you wanted to be um I have to say though, there is a lot of support in that too. Like even though like maybe it doesn't make any money, there is a lot of pride there too, that you are a writer and you know, and that, you know, people will read your work and the CBC wants to interview you. Like it's, you know, it's this weird kind of like, you know, cause they're never interviewed Why, you know, so it's, it's interesting. Anna, were you gonna say something there? Yeah, I was going to say that, um, you know, my experience within my family is that being both an artist and queer um, have been uh, complicated and challenging for, for different reasons, you know, and I think, you know, being an artist, there was concern about me and my well being and how I would support myself. And when I was a younger person, um, you know, I think I discounted that concern. And as I've grown, um, you know, and, and aged, uh, grown as an artist, I appreciate that concern now, you know, and I recognize that they were really coming from this working class place of like, how will, how, how can you make a life doing this? And, and I guess the other piece attached to it was, um, you know, my, my family members feeling very much outside of the culture. And so this like having agency and having voice, like it just seemed like a really an impossible um, you know, how, how does that work? So that's kind of a couple of different things there. Uh, and the queerness, there was no, and this has changed, but there was no point of reference. Like there are no other people like you, like this doesn't, this, how, how could, mm. how, how can you exist? Yeah. Um, you know, and that has shifted and changed, uh, but their concern, I think also was very much about them and how they would explain me to the family and so there were stories about me being you know oh Anna Anna's off doing something Anna's very busy Anna's very career oriented right so this image of this career oriented um, asexual spinster was you know that image is still I think I'm still explained in that way to extended family members but um, within my immediate family who I am and my 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 queer poly, my life is um, respected. Uh, and that's been a real, a real journey. Like that was not that that's been a 25 year event or, or process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. Mm. Yeah. Okay, well, um, I think it's 1245 almost, and we have to wrap it up, Mirko. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure we, that yeah, we could, we could go have on. like more yeah. questions. I have some in my mind. Yeah, we have, maybe next to, time. we have to come to Calabria in person, and then we can have like, like four hours. That would be great.
soon later. Yeah. So something to work towards. Um, okay, so I've already, uh, it says here, I'm supposed to promote other events. Yes. So <laughs> the social media handles have been uh, indicated in the chat. So there's a Facebook page called uh, Here and Now, an anthology of queer Italian Canadian writing, where Anthony and Liana will be posting events, future events. We also have a, a Facebook page for the documentary Queer, uh, it's called Creative Spaces, Queer and Italian Canadian. Uh, you could look at that. On Twitter, it's at Here Now Volume 1, because ah. there will be a Volume 2. So oh. already that 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 tells you that we're on a roll and uh, please come on June 22nd to the official launch hosted by the University of Toronto. Uh, there is also another event on the 29th at 5 p.m. Uh, Toronto time, which is uh, hosted by Villa Charities uh, of Toronto. Villa Charities is sort of the uh, organization that covers the Columbus Center for people of you who are familiar with uh, Toronto. Uh, what else? There's so, oh, this this uh, Saturday at 2.15, part of the Canadian Association for Italian Studies, there will be eight authors speaking. The Saturday after at 9 a.m. Eastern Time, we will have a panel of academic papers on queer Italian Canadian writing. And the speakers are Dominic Beneventi, Paolo Frasca, Elena Basile, and that is chaired by Michela Baldo, so all the academics. Uh, and if I may, if you're free, I know this is a sort of an awkward time, uh, but 12 noon on June 9th, my 12 students in my workshop at the University of Calabria who have been working towards, you know, the, the, the name of the workshop was writing in a safe space and it's about identity. So it's very much attached to the work that I've been doing with the documentary and the anthology. They will be doing what we did today. They will be reading the writing that they produced over the last seven weeks. So you're welcome to come. If you're interested, if you have any questions, I am putting my email address in the chat. Although I think you all have my email address, but I will put it there and contact me anytime. There you go, Mirko. Oh yeah, I would say that this is not the, like it's the starting point for, for, for um, another maybe um, right. collection or an anthology or other project. Yes. And, yes. Um, so yeah um and uh yeah well thank you all for 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 having taken part in this event uh, thank you licha for putting together um such amazing writers maria christina also for being here and um and of course all the writers for sharing their art and talent with with us and hopefully we'll also be able to organize another event in the fall as um uh, unical um, once the anthology is is out so stay tuned i would say yeah. thank you very much thank, so you. thank you everybody thank you thank you everybody thank you, ciao ciao bye, bye. thank bye. you everybody that bye. was great bye. thank you nick yeah, Grazie, bye, -bye, bye, -bye, bye, -bye, bye bye everybody thank you bye. Bye. Grazie. ciao Ciao. Ciao, Maria Cristina. Ciao, ciao, mi porto. Ciao. Bye, guys. Okay.